Good afternoon, everyone. It is Saturday, August 20th, which happens to be my parents' 62nd wedding anniversary. So Ooh. congratulations to them. And <laughs> this is the latest in Western Liberty Network's ongoing series of Saturday Zoom trainings on various topics. Um, as always, I want to point out that Western Liberty Network is a 501c3 organization. We do not uh, endorse or oppose any candidate, political party, ballot measure, or um, legislation, but we do train limited government grassroots activists on how to do all of those things. And what they do with the training is completely up to them. And uh, whatever comments they may make during this uh, session are completely their responsibility and do not necessarily reflect the views of Western Liberty Network. Uh, with that disclaimer said, the lawyers are happy and we will go to the share screen and uh, I will do my weekly review of the Western Liberty Network website. You should see it on your screen now. This is the WLN website. And when you type westernlibertynetwork.org, uh, this is what you'll see come up. And there are a lot of resources here for you. Um, at the top, we always have whatever is going on, whatever is upcoming, like uh, the session we're doing right now is advertised at the top. And uh, if you scroll down, you'll see other things that we have done, various conferences we have done. And on the right-hand side, are always different resources. Like here is a recorded session on um, organizing around local issues and about using social media as a candidate and as a, um, as a campaign worker. And you scroll down, there are speeches from Dennis Linticum, Christy Soltes, other speakers. If you scroll down to other events, um, here's a good one. Andre Ilyaronov, former Vladimir Putin senior economic director until he defected to the United States. He talks here. That's a very good one. Lots of resources on the on the homepage. If you want to get some training information, go to the training tab. If you go to the training tab, you'll see a summary of all the training that we provide. And then if you scroll down a little farther, you'll see um, various documents. These are training documents that stand up on their own, but they're designed to be provided with a live training. And you can click on the one you want. For example, click on this one, how to be effective in informal debates you'll get a PDF document like this that you can print out, you can copy, you can distribute. None of them are copyrighted. We want to make sure that everybody gets information out and that this gets read. Uh, I'm not concerned about copyrights or anything like that, but uh, you can pick the training document for the topic of your choice. And if you go down to the very bottom, you can download a PDF file containing all of the training documents. So if you like them, you don't have to download them one by one. Uh, go down a little further and you see the videos. This video is being recorded and it will be placed right here at the top as soon as it's finished, usually a couple of hours after uh, the session is over. But we have almost two years worth of trainings. I provide some of the trainings, but we have a variety of guest trainers, legislators, experts in their field, provide a whole bunch of training sessions on a variety of topics. So, you know, if you're new to this or if you want to enhance your skills or double up on your skills, you can literally go to these videos and go to these training documents and that in conjunction with what's on the homepage, you can literally design your own personal training curriculum. Um, so we also have conferences. Our next conference will be at the Embassy Suites Airport Hotel in Portland um, on February 3rd and 4th. That's gonna be our next major conference. There'll be 20 breakout sessions on a variety of topics. Stay tuned to that. We've got some more people coming in to the speech. We've got Joe Everton and someone named Gary coming into the system. So anyhow, um, Gary and Joe, uh, you have uh, missed some preliminaries, but you haven't missed any content yet. So if you want to uh, pick up on this, you can look at the recording on the training tab of the westernlibertynetwork.org website you can get uh, what you've missed so far. Uh, but we've talked about the website, the resources that are available on the website, and uh, did some legal disclaimers. So you haven't missed any of the content yet. Anyway, thank you all for joining us. So uh, if you take a look at the training and you like what you see and you wanna support Western Liberty Network, go to the support WLN tab and you can make either a monthly contribution or a one-time contribution. And uh, this is, entirely tax deductible because Western Liberty Network is a 501c3 organization and we are coming up with special bonuses for people who subscribe to the $25 and $100 a month things like special seating at conferences, uh, early notice of events, 
a uh, variety of things like that. We have t-shirts, we have lapel pins, lots of fun meets like that. Uh, and so uh, if you'd like to be an ongoing contributor, that helps us with our budgeting quite a bit. So with that, I'm going to stop the screen sharing and I'm going to say hello again, greetings to everybody. Um, I'm going to bring a document into the chat window. So if you have a chat window, go ahead and look at it and you will see a training document on the care and feeding of volunteers that I have just sent up. You can download this at your convenience. You can do it after the session or during the session, follow along or do whatever you wanna do. Some people have difficulty downloading files on the chat window. If you do, then <clears throat> go to the training tab of the westernlibertynetwork.org uh, website and scroll down to the training documents and the same document is available there and you can download that very, very easily. So we're going to work off of that. And um, what this particular training session is about is, is retaining volunteers. It's difficult to get volunteers. I, I always encourage people to find them uh, if you are running a campaign or if you are a candidate. You know, start with family, start with friends, go with coworkers, whoever you have, people who you are acquainted with and different political organizations, maybe your political party, maybe a service club, Toastmaster, Rotarian, people, where you, people who you know, um, try to get volunteers. This training is about things that drive volunteers away and how to avoid driving them away. Basically, how to retain the volunteers. Uh, it's very important that you value them. That goes, I think that goes without saying. Most people understand that folks want to be appreciated, but there are a few things you need to watch out for. The first one that I like to point out is, oh, by the way, if you have questions or comments, or if you want to interject something during the session, feel free to unmute your microphone and chime right in. Go ahead and interrupt. I like these things to be interactive. I'm not a wait to the end for questions kind of guy. So just go ahead and kick in whatever you think is useful. But anyway, the first thing I want folks to look at is burnout. Sometimes you'll find a person who is really enthusiastic about what you're doing, your campaign, your ballot measure, whatever you're doing, and they volunteer for lots of things. Yes, I'll be there next week. Yes, I'll be there for this. And they will volunteer for everything. And what you have to do is moderate that. As somebody who needs volunteer time, it can be very tempting to just say, okay, yes, please do it, but don't do that. You've got to maintain these volunteers for the long haul. Not only do you want the volunteers to stay with you throughout the course of your campaign, but you might want your volunteer to do a future project, whether you win or lose your campaign. There might be another thing that you want to want to do. I always tell candidates and people who are running ballot measure campaigns to come up with primary goals, which is always winning the election, but secondary goals. And one of those secondary goals is to build a network of good volunteers. And so to have a network of good volunteers, you wanna make sure that they have you know, balance. Talk to your volunteers, particularly your over eager beavers and talk to them about balancing their lives. Make sure that their family is okay. Make sure that their work is okay that these things are not suffering and that the time that they volunteer is in balance with the rest of their lives. A lot of eager beavers will kind of forget about that and in their initial enthusiasm. And then you'll find that they have problems to deal with at home or problems to deal with at work or else they have to start canceling on you because they have to reestablish that balance. If you identify an overly eager beaver, sit them down before it becomes a problem talk to them about balancing their personal life, their work life, and their activist life to maximize the number of hours they can provide, but they set those hours at a sustainable rate that they can keep up with. So that's a very important thing to do. Um, in the long run, they will also appreciate that you're not just sucking them dry of life and blood, that you care about them as people, and that uh, you want them to be successful in their lives, not just as a contributor to the success that you're trying to achieve. So burnout, that's the first thing to avoid. Second thing is cool out. The opposite of asking people to do too much too fast is not asking them to do anything at all. I've seen a lot of campaigns who were not really prepared for volunteers. They would have a little button to say volunteer and you would 
you know, people would click on it, put their name, address, phone number, things that they'd like to do, but they didn't have somebody there to give them a task. Um, if you are running a campaign, make sure you have somebody there that is responsible for monitoring volunteers that might come in online or might come in through some other means and provide them with something to do. Make sure that there are you know, neighborhood campaigns uh, to canvas uh, houses or phone campaigns or you know, whatever it is, door hanging campaigns, what, whatever you have going on, make sure that you have somebody on your campaign that is responsible for coming up with things for volunteers to do. And then when volunteers you know, agree to do something, you know, give them that to do. Because if they volunteer and they're not asked to do anything uh, or they're asked to do very, very little, they'll find some other way to occupy their time. And then when you really need them, they won't be there because they've committed to something else. So the opposite of burnout is cool out. And so you want to make sure that people are not going to cool out. <clears throat> Another important thing, and I find this particularly true in political parties, but it can be true in almost any kind of organization, is keep out. We've talked about burnout. We've talked about cool out. This is keep out. And this is when you have people who know each other well, and then somebody new comes along. They're not part of any of the social networks. Like if I go to a political party meeting, I'll find two or three circles of people who have known each other for years, and they tend to gravitate. They tend to, you know, go along together. You know, I like to uh, reference the production of the original Planet of the Apes movie. You know, there were people who were black and Asian and Caucasian, and uh, before makeup, they would tend to uh, congregate together. You know, there was some mixing, but the black people would tend to hang around other blacks and whites would hang around other whites and so on and so forth. And then they would get their makeup. And uh, some of them were chimpanzees and some of them were orangutans and some of them were gorillas. And uh, once they had their makeup on, the gorillas tended to congregate with gorillas and and the orangutans did the same, and so did the chimpanzees, even though they, you know, they were a mixed race underneath all of the makeup. Um, and so people who are uh, in groups that have existed for a while, they do the same thing. You come up with friends and you develop cliques. And then when somebody new comes, they don't really belong to any of the cliques, any of the circles. Uh, you know, In the Libertarian Party, for example, I know that there were situations where people would say, well, how do we know if they're libertarian enough, that kind of thing, and, and or they're Republican enough, or, or whatever, you know, and uh, um, it's important that if you are working in an organization that has, you know, long time membership, or if you're in a campaign where you've got people that have known each other for a long time, that you make sure that volunteers that are new mix with the people that are there, that there's somebody there, preferably the candidate, but it could be anybody who makes them feel welcome and includes them. And it's sometimes a good idea to talk to, you know, some of your volunteers that have been around for a while or who you know very well and say, hey, look, we're going to have some new people coming in. Do what you can to make them welcome. Some organizations actually uh, designate a person to identify new faces and make sure they've got cookies, make sure they've got coffee introduce them to a few people, make them feel like they belong. So you don't want to exercise the, the keep out method of losing volunteers. So you've got burnout, cool out, and so far keep out. And um, the next one is pull out. There are a lot of newcomers who come into an organization uh, that are you know, eager, they might be super eager beavers, which you gotta look out for. They might just be people who are willing to do a few things. But if you're an organization that is short staffed, you don't have very many volunteers, or you're uh, some kind of a political group that has a lot of ground to cover, but just doesn't have very many people to do it. What they will do sometimes is over ask the new person. They will, you know, say, oh, we've got some new meat here. We've got some uh, new people that, that we can get some more things done. So will you do this? Will you do that? 
and they might say yes and yes. And after a couple of yeses, they start to feel like they might be overextended and then say, I don't know. And then they start to feel uncomfortable and then they don't show up. So it's important that uh, while on one side, you have to be careful of eager beavers over committing, you also have to be careful of new people uh, being asked too much of them, uh, asking too much of new people. Start people out with something that is small, that is easy to achieve, where they can have a success. You know, something where it's like, okay, uh, we want you to participate in this event where we're putting out 100 door hangers in this neighborhood. If they show up, you cannot fail. You're just putting up door hangers. Give new people something initially that they cannot fail at. So when they come back, you thank them, you tell them that they did a good job, that they were successful. And if they feel like they are successful in an initial event, they will be more inclined to participate in a subsequent event. So, you know, there's a lot of balancing that you have to do here. And candidates need to really be careful about handling volunteers. If you do this correctly, over time, you can build a significant cadre of skilled and experienced volunteers who can work not only on whatever campaigns you are working on now, but campaigns that are going on in the future. Okay, as um, someone who had been active in the Libertarian Party, one of the things that causes volunteers to drift away is a sense that you cannot win. If you cannot win there, you know, it's natural to ask, you know, we're, we're a Republican running in a district that has 90% Democratic registration. Why should I bust my rear for a Republican candidate when I know there's no chance of winning? Okay, this is something that happens in a lot of different races. Um, I think it's different now. I think a school choice initiative could work well in Oregon, but there was a time when the votes were just not there. Um, and the same is true for a lot of uh, legislative races and so on. And as a, uh, someone who is active in the Libertarian Party, who very rarely wins elections, can't win is a big problem. So the key to can't win and overcoming that with volunteers is to have secondary and tertiary objectives. I could say to my people, uh, my volunteers, you know what, you know, winning this election is a great uphill battle and it's unlikely to happen unless lightning strikes. You know, just be straight up about it. Don't say you're gonna lose, but just say, acknowledge that winning is an uphill battle, if it is an uphill battle. You know, if you've got a even chance or even a better than even chance, you're not gonna say that. But if you are running an uphill battle, acknowledge that saying, you know, we're running an uphill battle. Anything could happen, maybe we could win. But even if we don't win, there are other things that we can do that will be of value after the campaign, no matter what the outcome is. One might be, we're going to get X number of media contacts. We're going to build a cadre of X number of volunteers. We're going to build a cadre of X number of financial donors. We're gonna raise X number of, of dollars. We're gonna knock on this many doors. These are things that you can tell people like, even if the race isn't an electoral success, we will have these facilities to use when we are lobbying for or against bills, working for or against ballot measures, uh, those kinds of things so that a volunteer can say to themselves, well, all right, maybe this race isn't going to win, but the race is a device to accomplish these other worthy things that are worth investing my time in. And that is one way that you can keep from losing volunteers based on the, the can't win scenario. Um, likewise, there's the can't lose scenario. Uh, sometimes Republicans have this problem in heavy Republican districts in rural Oregon where Republicans always win, uh, or in urban districts where Democrats always win. They've got a similar problem. You know, why should I bust my rear when I know you're gonna win anyway? You really don't need me, okay? Um, you can use a similar technique in these situations. You can say to your volunteers, you can say, well, you know what? We don't wanna take this for granted. 
you know, we're in a good position. I'd rather be us than them in this race. And so, you know, we're likely going to win, but it's not just about winning the election. It's about sending a message by, you know, winning with a large margin, or it's about, we want to do more than just win this election. We want to position ourselves to advance the following issues and to advance the following issues we need to mobilize the precincts. We need to get people on board. We need to get volunteers, train them. We need donors. We need all of these things. So even if you feel that there's no way that your candidate can lose the election, the volunteer still sees value in contributing to the campaign and putting in time. I've been yakking quite a bit. I want to make sure, are there any questions or thoughts or comments as we go through this? No, that's okay. All right. Yep, it makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Another another um, thing that drives people away is if there is no growth. It's important that you grow. People join organizations that do things, and people join organizations that grow. And if you are a campaign, you need to grow. You always have to have the number of your volunteers going up. You have to have the number of your donors going up. You need to have all of those things. If you are growing, it boosts the morale of your volunteers. Your volunteers say, this is a growing campaign. This is a growing organization. Um, so I'm, my time is well invested here. I'm a part of this growth. And so we want to make sure that that, that, is, that is going on. Um, another reason that volunteers leave is if there is no appreciation. Volunteers may say, oh, I don't need anything, but they do. They need the candidate or the leader of the ballot campaign or the, or the county party chair, whoever it is that works with volunteers. They need to regularly go around to every volunteer that makes any kind of a contribution and thanks them. Says, thank you very much for the help. Thank you for what you do. What you do is appreciated and is valued. And if you can show a particular way that their contribution was beneficial, all the better. After an election, you can say, uh, um, look at this, this precinct you covered. We did much better than in the precinct we didn't cover, and that's because of you. You know, that's something that people um, take to heart. Um, if it's before the election, you can say, you know what? I know that we're gonna do better in this precinct because you're involved uh, than we will in precincts where you're not involved. Thank you very much. You know, let them know, not just that you appreciate them, that you thank them, but tell them what the impact of their participation is on the campaign that they're working in. That way they know, you know, they get an approximate sense of the value. Sort of a vague thank you is fine, it's good, it's necessary. But if they can <clears throat> tie their activism or their work with a specific benefit realized by the campaign, um, that's all the better. Um, I would also recommend that if you are running any kind of a ballot measure campaign uh, or a candidate campaign, that every once in a while you have an appreciation event for your volunteers. It can be something as simple as going out for pizza or having a bowling night, something like that. There'll be work. Uh, I mean, they're not going to work at these events, but it's a good time to give people information. And while they're spending time eating pizza or bowling or going to top golf or whatever it is that you decide to do for them, um, they will share stories and they will educate each other on their experiences and, uh, and what they do and concerns. And you'll get, as they're relaxed and they talk, you'll get a sense of what the morale is of your volunteer uh, cadre. And uh, you'll be able to address any problems that you have. So this is all very, very good. Um, another problem is external opposition. This is a situation um, where if family and friends are opposed to a volunteer's volunteering, odds are you will eventually lose that volunteer. I call it external because it's external to the campaign. Um, if you've got an eager beaver, for example, that's volunteering for a lot of things and they have a family that they're a part of, maybe it's a young high school student who isn't home for dinner often enough because they're 
at your campaign headquarters working all the time. Um, if mom or dad says to that high school volunteer, you know what, this is taking too much of your life. Uh, you know, you're going to have to cut back on that and or even quit the campaign and spend more time, you know, make sure you're here for dinner and whatever the restrictions are. Uh, you don't want that to happen. Uh, likewise, I know that during political seasons in families where one or the other spouse is very politically active, sometimes it can create friction in the home. You're never home. You're going out walking on doors again. I need you to fix the fence. You know, these kind of things are killers uh, to a campaign and can be very destructive to the life of your volunteer and can uh, jeopardize their ability to volunteer in the future. So this kind of goes hand in hand with the eager beaver thing. Um, although this applies to more than just, you know, the over eager beaver, it applies to, you know, anyone who's working in a campaign, especially when things get intense, like in the months of October or September even. Um, so when you're talking to your volunteers, make sure that, you know, ask how their family is doing, ask if they're, you know, if their level of volunteerism is doing is is appropriate for their lives, ask if their balance is good. It's okay. You don't want to ask you know a lot of personal questions about their marriage and their family life, but it's perfectly okay to say, look, I want to make sure that you're in this for the long haul, and I want to make sure this is good for your life overall. How's your balance doing with your activism, your work, and in your home life? If it's good, you know, do we need to make any adjustments? Is there anything we can do to make it easy for you? These are important things to do to minimize the amount of external competition that you're going to have. Um, also, external conflict. This deals with personality clashes. You know, it's interesting if, if you're a member of an astronomy club or a chess club or a knitting club, the kind of people that you get in these clubs are generally pretty similar. You get similar personalities you know, there's some variances and all of that. And, and you've got people, you know, who've been there a long time that think the organization is theirs and they're wary of newcomers. There's always that dynamic. But in politics, it's worse. Uh, one of the reasons it's worse is because what unites people is an ideology. Uh, what unites people in a campaign might be getting somebody elected or getting somebody else out of office. But other than that, you can have all kinds of different people who have incompatible personalities be in that organization that are only there together because of the ideology or because of the candidate, people who would not otherwise socialize between each other. And when you get these things, um, it can give rise to faction, uh, can give rise to personality clashes. And, you know, fortunately, in most political campaigns, um, they don't live long enough to develop these attributes. Uh, you know, for example, if you really have a campaign that's going on now with, you know, if you get in the next couple of weeks, 20 volunteers and you've got a few people working on the campaign, those dynamics, uh, faction personality clashes are not going to manifest themselves in such a short span between say now and November. They can, but it doesn't commonly happen. This is more of a problem uh, with long uh, standing organizations that span across many election cycles, political parties in particular. And this is one of the reasons we have faction in political parties. And so um, one of the things that you can do if you see that you have personality clashes is, you know, the first thing is Keep them out of touch with each other. Give them jobs where they don't have a tremendous amount of contact. One person, for example, you could put on a research project, doing a lot of opposition research on the internet, doing you know, studies of precinct data. Another person you could have in the field you know, where the contact is going to be minimized and people who are you know, attracted to one personality or another personality could go in those different fields. That's one thing you can do. Another thing, sometimes you just got to sit them down and you got to say, look, I know you guys are having a personality clash. I don't know what the problem is here, but we really have to tie this together uh, and, and pull in the same direction, at least for the couple of months after election day, 
you guys can fight as much as you want, but we've got to pull it together. Sometimes that's enough to do it. Uh, sometimes that's enough to take care of it. And in a very extreme case, you might have to ask somebody to leave the campaign. Uh, that's not something you typically want to do. But you cannot have division within your ranks during a political campaign. Uh, at the, by the same token, if you have a number of people in your campaign with different kinds of personality types, the odds are that they're not all going to get along harmoniously or see things on the same, uh, with the same way or be on the same page. So you as the candidate or the campaign manager or the volunteer coordinator are going to have to manage and balance these personalities, the people who work together, put them together on projects, the people who don't work together well, put them on different projects. If it becomes an issue in the campaign, sit them down, straighten them out. Uh, and if necessary, you know, you've got to kick one or more people out. Sometimes you have to do that. I've been on campaigns where that's been necessary too. It's not a judgment on particular people. It's just an aspect of personal chemistry that can be productive or toxic for a campaign. And, you know, if you're focusing on internal campaign problems and personality conflicts, you're probably losing the race. So you want to make sure that that doesn't become a part of what you're doing. Um, another number 11 is policy disagreements. Sometimes people will disagree with specific policies. You know, you might say, okay, I am with this campaign because I don't want the other person to win. That said, I disagree with my candidate on this issue, that issue, and the other issue. Those things can be very toxic for a campaign as well. Um, if you have people like that, it's important to sit down with them, listen to their views on different policies. If you're a candidate, listen to their views on policies. Sometimes it's enough for people just to be heard and to be respected. And, uh, you know, and say, look, I understand, you know, you're a valued volunteer. I know that you don't want my opponent to get elected. And I know you're on my campaign for that reason. Um, I know that we agree with some policy issues and we disagree with some other policy issues. I'd like to hear what you have to say. It's important to do that. You will sometimes command amazing loyalty if you listen attentively and genuinely to somebody on your team who disagrees with you, who maybe is on your team because they just don't want the other person to win. You, it's, you never know where loyalty is going to come from. And if you listen attentively to people who disagree with you on policy, uh, that will sometimes inspire the kind of loyalty that will make them really fight for you and go the extra mile. And on occasion, they might give you something that you need to think about that might cause you to change your perspective or your approach on a particular issue. It could be of, of tremendous value. But you don't want uh, people in your campaign to be arguing about policy. It's important that they understand. You know, I understand, you know, no two people agree 100% all the time. It just doesn't happen. You know, you're on this campaign because you think that it'd be better for me to hold the office than the other person. Um, and that's fine. So let us stick with the things we agree on and get through this campaign. After we win the election, then let's work out these issues. Let's hear what everybody has to say and I'd be willing to listen. And if the arguments make sense, I'll be willing to uh, you know, ad adopt some of the positions of people who have different policy agreements. But if we don't win the election, it's all for naught. And if people are not pragmatic enough to see that, then they may not be people you want on the campaign. If you've got somebody who says, you know, I, I want you to win, but I want you to agree with me 100%, or I'm really not going to give you my full effort, you don't need that on the campaign. Um, and uh, you might want to say, look, I'm glad you're there. I'm glad you can help me. But I can't have this, just be frank, just be honest, but I can't have division within our ranks at this critical time. And, uh, you know, ask them to leave the campaign and maybe help in some other way or give them something further down don't ask them to leave the campaign, but give them something further down the trough that uh, you know, allows them to make contributions on the issues where they agree with you uh, uh, without causing dissent uh, among your ranks. So um, the final item is not enough fun. 
people volunteer if they're having fun. And some of them are dedicated to the struggle and want the victory. Uh, all of them do to some extent, but there are others who are there because they want a social experience. They want to meet people that they like, uh, meet different people that are, you know, of a different mindset than themselves, uh, not necessarily looking for a fight, just, you know, they want an experience. They want to get out of the house. They want to have fun. So it's important that you have fun. Uh, one way to make sure that everybody has fun is to have, uh, you know, uh, volunteer appreciation events that we talked about before. But another thing might be just to, you know, every once in a while when people are making phone calls, just show up and hand them all a, hand them all a $10 Starbucks card or uh, um, give them an award, you know, somebody who made the most phone calls or, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, try and make it a fun experience for them. Everybody wear a goofy hat day, uh, you know, when you come in to volunteer for, for the campaign, whatever it is. But um, having fun is really key to not only getting people to come back, but getting people to bring their friends and expanding your volunteer base you know, along the line. So, um, you know, I'll just go over these real quick one more time. You know, when you get volunteers, watch out for the overeager beavers. Don't let them burn out. Hold them back, even though it might be tempting to ask them to do, you know, more, um, you know, make sure that they maintain a balance in their life. But do ask them to do something. Keep them busy. Keep them engaged. Make sure they feel like they're a welcome member of the group that they're not socially isolated by people who you've known for a long time or people who've known each other for a long time. And uh, make sure that you don't ask them to do too much. Um, let them know that even if you're running an uphill battle, that uh, there's still value to the work that they are doing that will survive the campaign no matter what the outcome is. Or if you're in a good situation, do the same thing. Let them know that even if you're likely to win your election. You need them because you're doing things that will be of use after the campaign. Uh, make sure that you're always pitching for more volunteers, that you're always growing, that you're always expanding your scope. Make sure that you show lots of appreciation. Make sure that the people who are there don't have forces in their lives that are undermining their ability to volunteer. It's better to get a few hours every week that you can depend on rather than get a bunch of hours here and a bunch of hours there, but them not be dependable and they'd be canceling on you at the last minute. And also uh, be careful of factionalism. If you see it, start to form, find a way to channel it, but you've got to absolutely blunt it in the campaign. If you have policy disagreements with members of your staff, you know, acknowledge them, listen to them, but make sure you unite around the things that you can agree upon and defer disagreements until after the election when you have won and the conversation actually means something. And then finally, find ways to have fun. If you do these things and you make it an integral part of your program, if you are running a campaign and you have a written campaign plan, which I always advise, and handling volunteers is a part of your campaign plan, you will do much better in attracting and retaining and getting good work out of your volunteers than if you do not do these things. So that is my training on volunteers. Does anyone have anything to add to that or are there any questions or comments? This is oh. great. Thank you very much. Sure, John. Yeah. We, uh, uh, I noticed, you know, a lot of us in uh, various, you know, factions obviously come across each other in different uh, 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 you know, uh, educational freedom here and parents' rights and education. We come across similar, you know, things. And I notice, you know, sometimes it, you wonder if what we ought to do is consolidate. So, you know, what do you think about that? Is it, I, I notice some good things and bad things when you're not consolidated, you keep that isolation a little bit. But on the other hand, we consolidate, we can get a lot farther. Uh, what do you any, mean by consolidation? Comment? What's that? Uh, give me an example of what you mean by consolidating. And well, your okay. So, for example, uh, we're interested uh, with against the school board on uh, comprehensive sex education. Well, that relates directly to parents' rights in education and, and so on and so forth. And maybe we should combine them. And, and we do. We 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 join those other groups. But 
you know, you, you see what we, we got similar things. Combining things could be uh, powerful, sure. you know. Well, that's that's a strategic decision, uh, less to do with, you know, managing volunteers on a day to day basis and more of a organizational strategic decision. Uh, but uh, I, I can see a lot of situations where that would make sense, where organizations that have different agendas uh, coordinate their services uh, when they have common cause. I think that makes perfect sense. And then bring your volunteers along when you have common cause. So absolutely. Yeah. Bill, one thing on that, um, for our organization, Education Freedom for Oregon, we're trying to focus just on our bringing our two school choice measures to Oregon as our sole focus to empower parents, give them constitutional rights and so forth. So our philosophy is we wanna sort of stay in our lane. This is our focus. We love to you know, have volunteers, but we don't want to, in a sense, have all of these different groups join because each group has kind of its own specialty. So our thought is, well, our specialty is bringing school choice to Oregon and we would you know, we love volunteers to cross over. But um, if we merge, let's say with another organization, it might dilute the focus and we're trying to be you know, single-mindedly trying to help parents with the right to choose whatever school setting is best for them. So that's well, why we stay separate. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a balancing act. And um, even if you, even if you uh, uh, coordinate on a particular issue, it doesn't mean you merge as an organization or that your issues become merged. It, it might be that while you, it might have two groups with separate missions, there might be some overlap and you can certainly work together on yeah. the issues where that overlap exists without merging the organization's wholesale. Um, then you can bring the volunteers along uh, where, where it makes sense for you. Right. You know, and, and, and you know, because, for example, um, it was always very uh, kind of sort of sad over the many years of Roe versus Wade uh, and the organizations. There were so many organizations and they they needed to come together at some point. And I understand uh, Donna's point. And, and that's why I, I bring it up. Uh, you know, um, I kind of like the, the concept. I, I see people have to stay focused on their policy. And I think uh, the point here is you also need to make a policy and, and make a mission plan of what you're doing. I think that's critical to and make help the volunteers understand this is our mission, not this or that. But uh, we all support each other kind of in a way, and, and I, I, I don't want to dilute it, and I, I get that idea. I just wanted to know some you know, background and finish what other people thought. And I guess they see the same problems. We, mm -hmm. we want to have power, but we, we, don't, we want to keep on the mission, you know? Sure, so. sure. Uh, Joe, Gary, do you have anything you'd like to add? I think on that, I'm thinking of um, a group that I was working with uh, when we were fighting CSE, and it's, it involved some interactions with the, with the school board and it was really, there was a lot of focus there and a lot of intensity and, and willingness of volunteers to come out and and do work, right? There was some leadership and uh, it worked really well. And then um, I, I think, but we were very focused on that one subject. I think there's a lot of power that can be had if you have a lot of people who are focused on the same problem, right? And if you, if you dilute it a little, that could be a problem. But at the same time, once that event was over and it was settled, it was hard to maintain focus again. So um, I, I don't know. It's, it, in some ways, it may be nice if you had multiple subjects that were multiple areas of concern so that things didn't just um, kind of uh, extinguish after, after um, the, you know, the, the main concern was that that event was over or whatever it was. Yeah. You know, maybe um, if you have like four or five organizations that have different missions, but in the same general field, uh, you know, you could have a meeting, a bi-monthly meeting or something where the leaders get together, have lunch and talk about areas where they can work together and areas where they need to, uh, you know, pursue their separate missions. Um, and that way you can always, you know, constantly refresh it and, and not have to reinvent the wheel every time. A lot of left organizations do that. You know, well, you, you're, you're right. And, and I, I, I got to thinking about that. And that's good. You bring it up because that was my I was, I was thinking that was going to be the solution that uh, we need kind of in our, you know, with, meet with parents and rights and education, educational freedom mm -hmm. and get them together. Like you said, in, 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 the, in the town meeting thing, get us together. And even though we're not joining each other's groups, we we sort of know what, you know, talk about our thing. And it, it you're right. I think that's part of it. And we, we know what each other's doing a little bit. It 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 has a, a positive effect. We can make our own bases get bigger, uh, you yeah. know. Yeah, I did a study for Americans for Prosperity 
years ago of the different organizations on the left side that deal with different things. Um, one might have dealt with homelessness, one might dealt with uh, minority voting, another one, you know, all these different organizations. And a lot of them um, participated in sort of a council meeting, sort of a, a grand council of lefty organizations where the leaders would come and they would uh, look for, you know, it's like we've all got different missions and we're all doing our own thing and we're all a separate organization, but there's overlap in what we can accomplish. Where can we work together? And where can we come up with an agenda to combine our forces? And uh, while maintaining our identity, we can, you know, work together on specific issues and have an alliance on this issue, an alliance on that issue. Maybe not an alliance on every issue, but on this one, that one, the other one. Uh, the left is very good at that. Uh, the right hasn't done that so much. And what I hear you talking about, Phil, and, and even Joe is, is uh, you know, that such a concept is not unreasonable for uh, conservative leading groups. I, I think that's it. You know, when you, when you say that as a conservative, you always see that little small thing. I always wondered what you were talking about in the forum earlier that we had a week ago mm -hmm. was that, yeah, we're just, we're not talking with each other. And I'm like, let's get together and talk with each other and have the party like the left does, you know? Yeah. And I'm really, because I'm hearing from everything, all these things I'm getting involved with is a lot of people have some very common core things with each other, although we've gone on these different missions, you know? So. Yeah, that's right. Well, you've got phone calls to make, it sounds like, Phil. And, and it turns out is uh, Gary was the one who's on here, was the one who picked up a huge, massive database. And I, I'm going to bring up to Gary, I know he's on, on the line here, that we need to go through that list and, and start getting more info from these this group that we have now and the potential we have within those contacts. And yeah. we'll probably run across the Donnas and, and the uh, Joes here, you know, and um, yeah. we need to get a, a, a plan going out how we're going to let them help us and us help them. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually positive for cross helping them you know when when they need support at their board meetings showing up for them and so on and so forth so um, i think that's you know this is that and i think that's going to help us to become successful and grow you know and i'd like to ask um anyone who's on this call uh for a favor and that is um you know i put these notices out every week about a training on saturday um you know people are very protective of things like their own email list uh, for very good reasons. So I never ask for email lists, but I do ask people to pass along um, the notices of the training to their rank and file. So if anyone on this call has access to a mailing list, when you get uh, on Thursday or Wednesday, the notice of, of a WLN class, uh, if you think it'll be of value to others, pass it along your email list. And uh, I don't need to have any of the email addresses or anything like that, but it would be wonderful if some of your members would uh, come on to the call and um, obtain a skill they didn't have before and, and thereby enrich your organization with somebody that's got some new skills, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, even something small like that is, is an example of how organizations with different missions can help each other. Gary, you're the one person we haven't heard from yet. Do you have anything you'd like to contribute? Oh, I guess not. That's okay. It's okay. Um, so uh, unless Donna, Phil, or Joe, if you have anything for the good of the order, we'll call it a day and let you get on with your weekend. Okay. Thank you so much. Yep. I hope this was a value. Was this a value to folks? Yep, it was. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll do another one next week and God bless you all. All right, you too.